Hey everyone, welcome back to the arena. I'm MD, joined here by Matt. Uh, once we get into our special guest uh, soon enough here, but before that, uh, love and appreciation to our followership. What's up guys? We have another really cool guest here. This one, I, I wanna give a little backstory on after I introduce him. Uh, this is Seku Andrews. He's one of the most successful spoken word poets in the world. Um, he speaks at a lot of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, he's performed for Barack Obama in Oprah's Backyard. He has dedicated his career really to pioneering a mainstream industry uh, for spoken word, has built a seven-figure company on poetry, has had his work featured on dozens of major TV networks, and has innovated a new category of public speaking called Poetic Voice, and has also garnered prestigious awards in advertising, theater, business, you name it, poetry, music, including a Grammy nomination for Best Spoken Word Album. So with that said, uh, Seku actually came and spoke at uh, my company's offsite a couple of no November of 2022. And I was, as I'm sure you guys will see as well, I was blown away by just his ability to, to speak in public and capture an audience and really get his, his thoughts and his words across in a powerful way. And he had mentioned doing comedy improv as something that could benefit you, uh, make you more confident in public speaking, improve your listening skills, being present, all that stuff. And so put the idea in my head and uh, I started actually doing comedy improv as a result a few months later. And then fast forward to now, I've been doing it for eight, nine months and uh, I love it. So everything's kind of come full circle here. So I'm very grateful for Seku for introducing that beautiful art into my life. But without further ado, Seku, why don't you just provide kind of a background of who is Saker Andrews and kind of how did you get to where you are today? What's up, everybody? Uh, thanks for that, fellas. Appreciate that intro. It's almost like you were reading it something. It's crazy. It's like very <laughs> accurate. Um, <coughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, you summed a lot of it up. Uh, my name is Seku Andrews. I have um, been a full-time spoken word poet for now 21 years this past June. I uh, just celebrated my 20th and 21st anniversary of uh, when I quit my job as an elementary school uh, teacher in South Central Los Angeles and decided to go become a full-time poet and figure out what that meant <laughs> and uh, try to blaze those trails. And, um, and I came through that lens through uh, performing. I, I fell in love with with uh, the stage in middle school and started performing on stages and um, music and theater and acting and production and so forth. And um, and that led me to spoken word poetry where I really found a home. But the entrepreneur in me had to figure out how to make a successful long-term home out of that. And that's really what led me to where it is that I am today and creating new uh, vehicles and new avenues for spoken word to be successful. And uh, that's what led me to you all. I created a new category of public speaking called Poetic Voice that blends inspirational speaking seamlessly with spoken word poetry and uh, really wanted to disrupt the, the, the paradigm and the sort of expectations of what public speaking was and how performance can be used in public speaking and uh, have built a successful speaking category that led me to your organization where I keynoted in front of you all in poetic voice keynote form and uh, talked a lot about the power of improv and the, the power of learning to, uh, to transform how it is that you think as an innovator and as a leader, as an executive, as a business person, just as a human being by being able to always transform disaster into delight real time. And, uh, and people think about performance as, you know, this thing that performers do, right? And I try to make sure that I help uh, public speakers or help executives or help leaders understand performance techniques that they can use in their leadership, performance techniques they can use as an executive, performance techniques they can use in business or in public speaking. And so as I began to talk about those things, it was really exciting to hear uh, you, Mike, took that to heart, that you took action on that, that you went joined an improv troops, took some improv classes and um, really began to transform your ability to, uh, to, to, to stay nimble and to stay on your feet and to stay on your toes and be able to handle anything that's thrown at you in real time, uh, starting with that yes and foundational principle. So real excited to hear that, really excited to hear that you took that to heart and that you took action on that and that that's led us to where we are now. 
Yeah, no, it, it's uh, I'm super grateful that I was introduced to the the art form because it's it's just so much fun. So, what what exactly is maybe just to help our audience out? What is spoken woman or spoken word poetry, and like what drove you into theater? How, how did why did you kind of ultimately want to quit your job? Like there was clearly some desire there to to go and do a more kind of risky uh, route, if you will, than you know staying as an elementary school teacher so and you mentioned the entrepreneur in you so maybe just talk through a little bit like where did that internal drive come from yeah yeah it was you know i think it was all hardwired in me from my parents um think about my work it's a it's a combination of education entrepreneurship and artistry and both of my parents were parents were educators college professors uh so education was nurtured in me heavily uh both of my parents were entrepreneurs started their own companies um, and both of my parents were artists mom's a dancer choreographer father was a uh, uh, visual artist painter sculptor <clears throat> and so all of that was really nurtured in me and supported in me the creativity but also the commitment the follow through the education the you know the ability to to follow a path follow through learn something build a skill uh, but also the the willingness and the uh, the audacity that it takes to step off the path and say I'm going to go create a new path and, and teach new skills to folks and so forth and so and I think that really is what allowed me to have this this unique path of starting off in school middle school discovered acting discovered hip-hop fell in love with both and started hitting stages performing and um really developed my my ability to communicate through lyrics through poetry right through the poetry of lyrics as well as to be able to understand stage dynamics to be able to understand how to rock a crowd to be able to how to understand how to communicate effectively to a large room etc cetera, etc cetera. um through high school through college began to nurture and pursue both and then started to have more opportunities in music than I did in theater and started chasing record deals more heavily which led me to open mics as I began to start to try to build a, a fan base for my music and for my hip-hop you know it wasn't it wasn't the commercial formula at the time the stuff that was making money you know so I was a lot more poetic and so I had a lot of labels that were like, man, we love it. Like they were, I was getting the positive reinforcement, but they were like, ah, it's not the commercial formula right now. So I was like, all right, well, let me go and build my own fan base and, and, and take, take my, um, my future and my possibilities into my own hands, take ownership of it and create something myself. And that's really, and again, so then that entrepreneurship that was hardwired in me from my parents, I think took over. And I started to go to open mics to build a fan base for my music. And I would start to deliver my lyrics, spoken word style more, you know, more conversationally so that I wasn't locked into the cadence of the beat since the beat didn't exist because I was doing it a cappella. So I was like, what if I break that cadence and I just deliver it more conversationally? And that took off and my name started getting bigger on the scene. And then I was like, well, what if I start doing more traditional spoken word? And I started doing that and that took off my name got big on the scene bigger on the scene and that's when I kind of realized that I was accidentally falling in love with spoken word and that was like not the intention right I was like yo I'm trying to I'm trying to get a hip-hop career I'm trying to get, get a record deal you know I'm trying to be the next Jay-Z and and then suddenly it was like poetry like what am I going to do with that you know so it's like I was I always make the joke I was leaving suddenly had to face the prospect of leaving a multi-billion dollar industry for a multi-hundred dollar industry right and trying to figure out like how do i make a living off of this and i don't i don't have <clears throat> in hip-hop you can you know you turn any direction and see where it can take you see the signs of success you don't have that in spoken word i couldn't turn and see oh how do people you know have a long-term career how do they have a long-term trajectory what do you do as a as a poet five ten fifteen twenty twenty five thirty years in the game how, you know, can you raise your kids off poetry? Who has houses that they purchased off poetry? Who has, who's been able to do it and, and never look back and make a career out of this? And I just wasn't seeing those examples and those models. They had people that did it, they popped in and out of it. They went, they did it for a while, it got hard, money dried up. They went to go get a job. They did it for a long while and then 
they kind of just got tired of the grind and they went to go teach or they went to go, um, they wrote books and authored and, you know, took their skills to a different industry. And so I just started to feel like that's a shame. The more and more I was falling in love with the spoken word, the more and more I was feeling like, what a shame that we have to leave our art form. Um, especially because I was getting mixed messages. On one end, I'm getting the message that says, yeah, there's no way to really, um, to do this long term. There's, there's no, it's not worth a lot, right? There's the perception of the broke poet and you got like, um, you know, folks that are, you should just be happy to be here as the poet. You know, we don't have any money to spend on the poet. There's just, there's not, there's not a budget for the poet. Well, you can perform in between the real acts, you know, while the bands are setting up and the people that we actually paid to come, we'll throw the poet on there. And there was just this real low perceived value. But then on the other hand, I'm hearing, this was the most amazing thing ever. Oh, this was the, this made our event the best it's ever been. You communicated value better than our public speakers, better than our executives, better than, and I'm going, well, wait a minute, there's this disconnect here. So maybe, my job then is that's different than I thought it was going to be. Maybe my job is to is to create that connection. Maybe so, my job is to bridge that path, you know. And that's really what led me to start to feel like my purpose was to more build an actual uh, industry for spoken word, and that's really what's driven the past twenty years. So, explain how like why did you become an elementary school teacher? Was this always like? I just need some income here while I try and figure out the career plan on the poetry side? Or was there a point in your life where you're like, you know what, this is a hobby, this is a passion, but it's not my career, it's not where I'm going to make money. I'm gonna go a route where I can make more stable income on the elementary teaching side. How did you, yeah, walk us through kind of like the the thought process of why you started teaching instead of going all in at, at the onset into poetry? Yeah, so the teaching really came, <laughs> I was not, I actually vowed that I wouldn't become a teacher, um, which was interesting. I, I was chasing entertainment. I wanted to be an entertainer. Um, so like I said, I was chasing acting. I was chasing Hollywood and, and record deals. And, uh, but again, it, you know, education, entrepreneurship, all that, uh, uh, all that balance had been nurtured in me. And so I wasn't the dude that was like, you know, I didn't have the story of like, oh yeah, I was, I was so dedicated to my art that I was homeless and I was sleeping on my boy's couch for years until, you know, so-and-so record company discovered me, you know, like, I was like, nah, I kept, you know, my brother kept a job, you know what I mean? Like, I was like, I was like, I'm trying to pay my rent. I, I'm going to be responsible with this, right? So, so I graduated from uh, Pitzer College out here in Claremont, California, in, in the LA area. And um, I graduated in sociology, but I graduated pre-law. And I was expecting to go to law school. I was expecting to be an entertainment lawyer as a backup to being an entertainer. And so I started working in law firms, um, just trying to, you know, just get some experience in the industry before I decided to go to law school. And I worked in various law firms around LA. And I, you know, you quickly start to realize law is not really a backup. <laughs> you know, you talk about yeah. <laughs> law is going to be a backup to something like you think about the hours that are invested in the money invested into law school and then the bar and then getting your internships and then you go get a job and the hours that attorneys work. And it's like, that's not a backup. Like, that's a complete commitment. Right. So I was like, and then on top of it, I'm also like, and you don't really want to just be a lawyer. And I'm looking at these lawyers working these hours and I'm like, you either got to just love the law to work these hours or you got to just love money and you just earn it however. And I was like, yeah, I love, I don't love the law. Like I didn't have a particular passion for the law. And yeah, I want to, I want to make money. But if I'm going to work these kind of hours and, and be this hard on myself, like I want to be, I want it to be for something that I actually do love. And then I also had in the back of my head, you know, I do want to be an entertainer, right? Which means I could, as I'm, <laughs> as, I'm as I'm thinking ahead to like me being an attorney, I'm like, I don't know if I want to be that attorney that's like meeting with a client, a hip hop client and like, yeah, you know, I could uh, uh, help you negotiate your record contract, but also check out my demo. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that ain't a good look either, right? So the shameless plug, right? And I'm like, so let me as, as I'm as I'm contemplating all this, uh, I really started to feel like I should just I should give entertainment a shot before I, you know, I can always come back. I, it's not like there's an ex expiration date on being an attorney, right? So, but there is on being an entertainer in, in some of these industries. So maybe I give entertainment a shot. And so teaching, substitute teaching became my, what I call that actor waiter job. You know, 
like the actor that goes and gets a job as a waiter because the schedule's flexible, they can go on auditions on a moment's notice, et cetera, et cetera. Well, substitute teaching was that for me. It was the job that would allow me to do something that I, and I was good at, that was purposeful for me, that I, I, I um, that felt good, but, um, and that I had skills at, but um, gave me the flexibility to take the job and, you know, to take the world tour that I knew was just right around the corner, <laughs> you know? And so, I started as a substitute teacher and I vowed that I would not become a full-time teacher because I knew that I would love it. I knew that I would be good at it, but I knew it ultimately wasn't what I wanted to do. And about, um, about eight months later, I, eight, nine, I don't know, nine, 10 months later, um, after working as a substitute teacher, I ended up breaking the vow. I took a, a, a long-term job as a full-time fifth grade teacher, um, took a permanent job, and basically it was true. I loved it, I was good at it, but it ultimately was not what I wanted to do. And I was, you know, feeling like, I mean, I'm working with kids in South Central LA, I'm working in an inner city school, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm very much feeling the social impact of, these kids need my 110%. And I was a good teacher, and, and the kids, you know, I had a great experience, the kids loved me, but I just felt like, you know, sometimes you can see that tenured teacher down the hallway that's been there for 35 years and all they do is hand out worksheets and talk on their phone all day, right? And I'm like, I can't be that. They need, they need my 110% and I can't give that 110 if I'm out chasing entertainment at night, if I'm going to hip hop shows, if I'm performing, if I'm in the studio, if I'm doing all these things. So I just felt that inner conflict and I was like, let me step off and let me um, try to do entertainment for real and give it a real shot and again just like i said i can always come back to being an attorney i knew i could always come back to being a teacher um but what happened the trick was i thought i was going to step off and become a hip-hop artist but as i started going in that four-year period that i taught that same four-year period was when i started going to open mics which were typically spoken word poetry open mics and i was going there to build a fan base for my hip-hop and then I, that was when I accidentally fell in love with spoken word poetry. So what I didn't expect when I made that decision was that I was going to be quitting my job to be a full-time poet. That came sort of during that four-year period where I just found myself going, damn, it's a shame that we don't have a career and a, a career path and an industry to follow. And that entrepreneur in me kicked in and said, well, maybe, maybe it's up to me to create that. And that's when I really found myself sort of passionately excited about doing that but also terrified, right? And I feel like that's one of the greatest incubators of growth. And you probably heard me talk about this um, when I spoke to your audience. <clears throat> I feel like one of the biggest incubators for us growing ourselves into our greatness is to keep ourselves in places that feel part terrifying, part exhilarating. Um, and that's what stretches us. And so that was me stepping off, thinking that I was gonna be a hip hop artist, all of a sudden leaving this paying job, paying job check paycheck every day benefits retirement granted you know you're not rolling in millions of dollars as a teacher but it was still stability i was still paying my car note and my rent and now all of a sudden i'm stepping off to become a full-time poet with no models for what that means and how to follow and that was that sort of exhilarating terrifying place that i just decided to step into and, and to see what happened so poetic voice can you had mentioned there's there were two sides of it that you were kind of battling one was like the idea of the broken poet and people weren't giving you the respect you felt you deserved. And then you said you had the other side where people were like, this was, you provided more value than any public speaker has and any executive, et cetera. Yeah. Can you just give the audience, uh, our listeners, an example of poetic voice, maybe similar to what you kind of what you talk to uh, my company about and, and why maybe, and maybe kind of illuminate what the, the value that you're kind of able to provide because what you said in terms of better than any public speaker we've had, um, creating more value than any executive we've had, like those are very, those are very big compliments, and I know they're true. So just kind of help maybe the audience understand like what exactly is poetic voice and how you're able to get these messages across. Yeah, yeah, great question. I, so what began to happen was um, as I started to realize realize that I needed to. The reason why there was this perception of the broke poet and why spoken word poetry had so little perceived uh, or, 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 or why there were so few successful poets um, with long-term careers in spoken word poetry 
was because there was such a low perceived value of spoken word. Um, and so I knew that I needed to begin to raise that perceived value. And so as I was starting to kick open doors and just looking at where, where do I, where can I take poetry where there is existing monetization, there's existing money there, they're paying other people. <clears throat> they just for some reason have, have it in their mind that poetry is this thing that we see for free at an open mic on Tuesday nights. You know, like why would I pay the poet all this money? Um, sure, I got to pay the singer this money. Sure, I got to pay the comedian this money. Sure, I got to pay the dancer or whatever. But that's a part of that is because there are they have an industry. There are there's infrastructure. There's agents. There's unions. There's all these things you know fighting for the value of those artists. And we didn't have that as spoken word. So as I just began going, where do I take this? The first place I took it um, to start monetizing it was the corporate world. Um, just saying, look, they have dollars and they will put dollars into events for people that can rock their rooms. And I believe spoken word can rock these rooms. And so I started, actually my first client was Nike. It was amazing, it was the blessed first client to have. Um, I did, a, I did a, um, a film that Nike was doing in partnership with MTV that was called Battlegrounds. And it was a celebration of street ball. And they had this king of the court uh, battle across the country of who was the best street baller. And uh, Widen and Kennedy brought me in to narrate the film with spoken word poetry, kind of like almost warrior based, you know, general calling the soldiers to war kind of uh, spoken word poetry that would just get you pumped up talking about these quote unquote soldiers battling for king of the court on street ball uh, courts. And that was a big hit. And Nike brought me to the campus for one of the corporate presentations to perform the theme battleground poem. And you know, they had all the other departments that got up there with their PowerPoints and their laser pointers and their traditional presentations. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I got up there and jumped up from the middle of the audience when it was Battlegrounds turn. And I'm like, I want soldiers, you know? And everybody's like, whoa, what the hell is this? And it blew everybody away. And light bulb went off and was like, yeah, there's something to this. Now the entrepreneur me kicks in. It's like, what do we do with this? So I just began working with Nike more and more. But what happened was they kept throwing me in entertainment because the perception was this is the value for spoken word. This is the only value that it has. Number one, nobody wants to hear it for longer than two to five, six minutes, you know, three, six minutes. Number two, it belongs at the, uh, the company holiday party, um, not the senior leadership meeting, or it belongs at the fashion show, right? Something that's more entertainment based, not the, the, the high level corporate meeting. And I just kept, the more and more I kept doing it, and the more and more I kept getting the response, the more and more I started to realize spoken word has the ability to capture dense amounts of very cerebral, intellectual, strategic information and deliver it in a concise and very human way. Far more than singing does, com comedy does, you know, some of these other art forms, but nobody's using it for that. And so I began, I had to show and prove, and I just began to, all these companies that were telling me, no, this, not that, I began to kind of push the boundaries. Yeah, they say they only want two minutes, I'd write it for, for, for five minutes. Oh my God, we love it at five minutes, keep it that. We only want five minutes, I'd write it at 10 minutes. I can cut it if you want. No, don't cut a thing, it's amazing, right? So I just began pushing the envelope to show them what it can be, to break their paradigm of what they thought it was and the, and the value that it had. And the same thing with um, where it should be. Um, again, holiday party, come to Christmas party, not the, uh, not the senior leadership meeting. Uh, and then the tide turned when I did Nike's analyst meeting. So up until then, I had been doing basketball. Oh, write a Kobe poem, write a LeBron poem, write a tennis poem, a soccer, football poem, right? Um, and then I did uh, Nike's analyst meeting, and Nike was heavily focused on the consumer and really uh, respecting that the dynamics of brand and marketing and so forth were changing as consumers had more power. And they were like, write a piece that celebrates that and talks about that. <clears throat> and I wrote a piece called Consumer 2.0 that I did at Nike's analyst meeting. And they were like, it blew them away. And they were like, oh my God, these analysts, they never, this was number one, their highest value, most important meeting, you know, as a company, it helps to set the value of the overall company. And they were like, these analysts, they never applaud, they never laugh. And they, they were like, you had them laughing, you had them cheering. Like even we brought in celebrity athletes and they get, they don't, they just sit there stoically and they were like, this is amazing. And suddenly the light bulb went off for me, but also for Nike. And they were like, wait a minute, maybe it is, you know, maybe it is business value, right? So suddenly I stopped getting booked for fashion show and the, and the football poem. And now it was like brand was calling me and PR and finance departments were calling me. And they were like, bring spoken word here. We want spoken word for our meeting. So I just began pushing those envelopes and breaking those paradigms. But 
I kept running into, yeah, 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 but keep it short, keep it short. And so as I began writing, I began longer and longer. I was like, this, you guys have these speakers that come in and they deliver a 45, 60 minute, 90 minute keynote. And you got these executives that deliver, you know, the, the outside speakers delivers the insight and the inspiration. And then the executive speaker delivers the inside information. And here's the corporate strategy. And then you have the performer that delivers the, the, the raises the energy in the room and, and I was like, but why does it have to be three different people? <laughs> you know, even the opening video, you got an opening video that quiets the room and galvanizes the room before the performer, before the executive, before the inspirational speaker. And I was like, I feel like spoken word could do all of that. And I feel like there's a missed opportunity. And that's what really what made me start going. I want to push the envelope and start creating long form uh, keynote con spoken word content that's in keynote form. And I kept struggling with what to call it. And everyone, you know, I kept calling myself a strategic storyteller or a motivational poet and all these different things. Um, and I finally had one of my, my business buddies that was like, you know what, you need to own the brand. You need to create a new category. And well, no, he was like, you need to own the brand and own the name. And that's what made me go, I need to find my own name to call it. And then in the meantime, I went to another business event and I was struck by something that uh, one of the uh, pioneers in Forefront, cats of business coaching <coughs> said um he said if you want to be number one in a category create the category and that stuck with me and that was right around the time that i was grappling with what to do with this thing that i was trying to create and i was like i need to create a new category i just need to stop trying to have it be an offshoot of something else and go into the world saying this is something new damn it let me explain to you how it works and that's a hard path that is the, the road less traveled everyone kept telling me if you want to have, you know, it, it would be sure, sure it would be easier if you drop the word poetry, you get more dollars, you get a higher fee, but it, the word poetry is what people are struggling with. And I was like, yeah, but what I also began to realize is that my purpose on this planet in my career, a big part of my purpose outside of inspiring the world, outside of teaching the world how to be inspiring was to help create more of an industry for spoken word poetry. And I can't create an industry for something if I'm also abandoning it and changing, you know, just saying, I don't want to associate myself with that thing. So it, it was a harder path, but I ultimately created Poetic Voice as a new category and then had to put that term on the speaking industry's tongue. I had to teach them how to sell it. I had to teach speaker bureaus and speaker agents how to sell it. I had to teach the world how to place it. Stop, you know, oh, it just needs to be this. What's the sweet spot? This is the longest. Nobody wants to hear. I had to start. I changed all of my contract, my terminology. I stopped referring to myself as talent, as artist. I started referring to myself as presenter and speaker. I had to raise the perceived value. It was this long, arduous, strategic process of saying, this is what you have to do when you're trying to put a new term, a new word, a new concept um, on the world's tongue and in the world's mind. And it started to work and finally people began to realize oh i had to teach people if you say this word instead of that word you'll reduce my speaking fee by two zeros so don't do that here's here's why you're not getting your client to book it because you keep describing it in this way but it's not that that's your limited perception of what it can be so the more and more i did that the more and more successful it began uh, began to become and by the time you saw me at your organization you saw much more the fully flushed out what poetic voice is, what it can be, where it goes. And that's why it was able to, I was able to take what happened 15 years ago at Nike when they were going, this little three minute thing that you did, it captured what we are trying to say better than our executives were able to do and better than our outside speakers and athletes were able to do. And I was like, I told you so, now here's where it can go. You then saw 15 years later <clears throat> what it was able to become. And funny side note, Consumer 2.0 over the past 15, 20 years has been hands down one of the most popular and reused and repurposed bits that I have used in multiple keynotes because at the end of the day, it was timeless, timelessly effective. The only thing that made it, you know, that dated it was the actual technology I talked about. So if you look at that piece that, you know, what I think it was probably about a three, it's probably about a six to eight minute piece. Um, Everybody's still digi dealing with digitization. Everybody's still dealing with exponential technology. So me talking about how those power dynamics have changed has still existed over the past, uh, you know, couple decades. I just had to change Sidekick to then BlackBerry to then iPhone to the, you know what I mean? It was like yeah. I changed the names of the of the phones and the technology that I was using, but the concept everyone's still grappling with.
and it's not going to change for several decades to come, which is why I was able to still take that piece and use it in these expanded keynotes forms to give such to give such a human and 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 emotional value to what people expect from a very cerebral intellectual keynote. Are you able to give? So I hate to put you on the spot, but I, have you heard poetic voice before? Yeah. Are you able to give a short little? Can you give us an example of like what I heard? Uh, at, at, and what other people at different company events here, like, I, I, it, it's, it's very unique and very powerful. And I'm just, I, I would love for, the, for our audience to kind of really get the full experience. Yeah, uh, let's see here. Um, well, I mean, I'm talking about Consumer 2.0. I'll give you a taste of that. <clears throat> um, this is, this was intent, just so you can get a sense of what you're, you know, this is sort of a standalone version of it. But what has happened is as I created Poetic Voice, Poetic Voice is defined as the seamless integration and seamless is being the key word. There are plenty of, look, I, I didn't invent performing on public speaking stages. <clears throat> plenty of performers um, that do that, some poets that have done it as well. What typically, what I noticed is that it became more of a glorified set where you have uh, someone would perform and then the audience would applaud and then that performer would then go talk for a while and they tell some stories and then they'd set up the next performance and now I'm going to perform this piece and then they perform and the audience would applaud and then they talk for longer. And so it was just this, this set that you had, right, where you always knew this is the performance and this is the speaking. And I found myself going, but wouldn't it be cooler if you didn't really know when the performance ended? and the public speaking began, when the theater ended and the spoken word began, when the story ended and the business content began. And so that's what creates this leaning in effect with poetic voice, where the audience can't get ahead of you. A lot of times with public speaking, the audience is ahead of you. The person gets up there, they put up on, this, on the uh, PowerPoint, here are the five points that I'm gonna talk about. And then the audience goes, okay, got it. I'm gonna check TikTok and they check out, right? Because they're like, I got it. I know exactly where you're going. Okay, this is the point you're going to make. This is the point you're going to make. And if that speaker is not engaging enough to really just turn that into an experience where I'm like, whoa, I know you said that's what you were going to talk about, but you blew my man, mind and how you talked about it, um, then, then the audience checks out. And I found myself going, I want to create an experience where every time they feel like they're about to check out, I change modalities. And so it's like, yeah, I'm watching a, a public speaker. Okay, got it. I know what a public... Oh, wait. Whoa, now this is a... This is, he's rhyming. This is crazy. Like now it feels like I'm watching Hamilton, you know, this is dope. Like, oh wait, now he's telling a story and what the hell, how I'm, I'm crying and what the hell, how am I crying at 8 a.m. at a tech conference? What is going on? Oh wait, oh crap, that was a great business point. Let me pull out my phone or my pad and, and write that down, take it back to my team. So it just keeps changing and you can't get ahead of it. And it keeps the audience leaning in and that's that seamless element. So what happens with Consumer, consumer 2.0 is I began to just weave that in as a section, a poetic section. I might be talking about <clears throat> how we need to disrupt ourselves um, as executives, as business leaders and so forth. And one of the things that you can do, um, one, one of the reasons why you need to disrupt yourself is because the expectations uh, of your customers and your consumers are changing and they're, you no longer live in, in a world where you can say, here's what, here's what my product is, here's what we're going to do, here's, here's how it works, here's how I'm going to market, here's how my messaging is going to be. The, the audience is saying, no, that's no longer how it, how it works. Let me tell you how it works. And all of them are hearing our consumers speak to us in a voice that is clearly telling us, and then I go into it. Right? No explanation, no, let me now perform this poem for you. I just suddenly change voices and I begin to give you the voice of the consumer. And that voice says something like, this is a super old version. So let me see if I can uh, ad lib it for you. I'll yes and it in the spirit of improv. Uh, let me attempt to explain this to you as plainly as possible. You have entered the age of consumer climate control. We decide something's hot, hope you dress light. We say that's cool, hope you like ice. Resistance is futile. It is a custom made, made to order life now. Navigated by a, a generation born in cyberspace with unbound places to go and people to interface with. So face it, the old model has been replaced with the new matrix and I know adaptation is tough to taste quick, but if you... Okay, I'm gonna need you people to keep up, okay? Keep up. There's a new sheriff in town. Uh, what does I say? Uh, 
There's a no, there's a, let's see, what you, ex what you are experiencing is a game-changing demand for delight, the unveiling of a digital disruption, a customer coup, welcome to Consumer 2.0, changing the laws of supply and demand to supply on demand, we want what we want, how, we want it and we want it now, please try and keep up, people, keep up, we take our radio by satellite, our videos emailed, our stereo mobile and small enough for ourselves, we are alphabets with 4Gs, reporters with blogs, we harvest our blackberries, this is the old version, we shuffle iPods this is the old version. We hang with cyber friends at online malls and go shop go on shopping sprees through shopping weeds. We put the global in local. We put the mobile in social. We're the ones on this dance floor that you need to try to get close to. But if you want to know how to dance with us, oh you better know how to get your groove on and get your group on and get your game on and get your growth on. Brush up on your digital native. I am the first in my family to speak without an analog accent. Ebanix is my native language. Language. Zerics and one, zeros and ones are mother tongues. We're like androids playing an acoustic set. We are digitized and unplugged, updated and debugged, 5 g and deslugged. People, you need to keep up. Keep up. It is no longer a walkway. It is a runway, people. And this year's fashion is all mobile, like tablets with shoulder straps that give purses the blues. Our money is on the move. Our fashion is in our phone. So if you like it, then you should have put a ring to tone on it right so that's example that's an example of like i'll just go into this fast pace and then i'll come out of it as fast as i went into it as seamlessly right and the audience is laughing and i put a big picture of beyonce on the slide doing her like single ladies dance when i'm like you should have put a ringtone on it and they're <laughs> laughing and then i'm like you know and this is how fast it's coming at us so this is why we need to disrupt ourselves and i just keep going into the speaking right so they've just had this like complete artistic experience that feels like they just got finished watching Tamilton and then I go into the the rest of the, the public speaking part of it and the talking and the storytelling as if they were now watching a TED talk which is why I describe poetic voice as Hamilton meets TED so now I'm gonna try it uh, no I'm kidding um, but, go. Uh, yes <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, uh, Maybe at another another time, but so it sounds like um, a very colorful, creative way to deliver a message to what is traditionally a very grayscale audience. And um, you know, walk me through just kind of how you're feeling when you're trying to get this off the ground. You're creating an entirely new category. Um, I'm sure you're met with people who aren't taking it serious. Um, creativity, art, in, in a sense, maybe isn't supposed to be taken so serious anyway. Um, is there an imposter syndrome? Is there a sense of like, you know, I'm going to be laughed at or I'm going to be mocked or this is just going to fall flat on its face? How much did you have to overcome just mentally to get through a barrier to where you can actually go to an executive leadership team and, and perform this? Hmm. <laughs> I mean, it was nothing, son. I'm gangster with mine, you know? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, yeah, no, all of the above, man. It, it, um, it's hard. That's why I said it's the road less traveled. It was, I chose the harder path for sure. Um, and I think that you have to be, you have to either be hardwired or you have to rewire yourself to take this kind of path um, because you 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 have to fortify your self confidence, your self awareness, your mental health. You you have to fortify all that to be able to go up against um, the world telling you that what you do, what you see, uh, what you envision is not how it works, um, and you're wrong and we're going to school you kid and we, you know, we're this billion dollar company we're this billion dollar industry we're these experts that have done so and so and that's not how it works um and so i do there there were a tremendous amount of no's there was there were a tremendous amount of um ego checks uh there was a tremendous amount of imposter syndrome you know how imposter syndrome for me <coughs> has played out is that i am two things number one I'm a poet, so there's a perceive there's a perception uh, of spoken word poetry 
people think that they don't like, but unless you are a spoken word poetry fan, you think that you don't like spoken word poetry. You th or you think that you don't like poetry, period. A lot of people, you know, I make the joke, you probably heard me make this joke in, in, my, um, in my keynote when I was like, you know, I, I, uh, people hear that a poet is opening their general session <laughs> or their executive symposium, you know, and they're like, oh God, like what can I, what else can I be doing with my life if I sit here and listen to this crap, you know? And a lot of times it's because, you know, they may have just suffered through uh, their kids' middle school, seventh grade poetry reading, you know what I mean? And that's the perception of what pre-existing perception uh, of what spoken word poetry is. Or they think about it as that dead art form that they hated in high school. Or they think about it as some guy doing some soliloquy to a daffodil that they have no idea what it means, you know? Or some slam poet yelling at him for three minutes. Some revolutionary poet screaming at him about politics. Some beat poet with a beret and bongos in the background. And they're like, Harry, it, you know? And so they're like, uh, like this is not what I, number one, I don't know why it would be at, at this meeting and I need to talk to these meeting planners about why the hell they would have this because this is ridiculous and I didn't pay all this good money to come listen to this crap, right? There's that and like why would I even want to hear it even in my personal life outside of the, the business community? So I'm up against all of that and the people that sell me are up against all of that. Um, you know, I always joke that there are the person that is that is selling me to their leadership, that's bringing me in, they're, they're going, I, 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 you know, we say that we're, you know, they're usually the innovator at the company. They're the one that's the, the you know, the radical, the one that's like saying, we gotta do something different. You can't keep saying to our customers that we're different from our competitors if we don't do anything different. So they're saying that to their leadership and they're going, I know, I know what you're saying. Like, he's a poet, I know, I know. Don't worry, he's gonna be awesome, he's gonna be awesome. Don't worry. And they're like, why the hell, don't worry, he's gonna be awesome. And then they're turning to me and saying, please be awesome, yeah. <laughs> right? Like my job, my credibility <clears throat> depends on this. I vouch for you and I love making that person a hero. I can't tell you how many times that that person, after I've come off stage and stood on, stood in the audience with them and people are around me and they're cheering and they're tearing and they're applauding and so forth, that person is standing next to me and their boss comes up and their boss <laughs> says, you know that joke that you made about people hating poetry? I, I was that guy, I was the one. And I'm so glad that she convinced me to do this because this is the best event that we've ever had, right? And that person is just looking like a hero right next to me and I, was, and, and I love giving that back to the person that took a chance on me. Um, because because th that's what we need. We need somebody to ultimately take a chance on us when you're trying to go up against an entire industry. And so there were so many no's. I remember hearing somebody when I was in the studio back in my rap days and we were talking about the kinds of artists that were not the typical commercial artists but made it. And we were talking about Lauren Hill and somebody was like, you know why Lauren Hill is successful? Not just because she's amazing, she's talented, blah, 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 but because she has somebody on her team that every time a door is slammed in her face, they go, knock on the next door. Like somebody that believes in that talent enough to say the whole world is wrong and I'm gonna show you. And everybody's had that. The Madonnas and the Beatles and all have those stories of, you know, the, the, the uh, what is it? Harry Potter, the author, JK, whatever, Rowling, Hollings, whatever the name is. Like, you know, oh, I got 175 rejections until I got somebody and then it's the biggest book in the world. So we all have those, those success stories, but you have to be able to have the, the fortitude to be able to get through those 175, 174 rejections before the 175th person says yes, and you can prove the world, <clears throat> prove the world wrong. And so I, I, I do feel like um, there's, a, there's a piece when I just celebrated my 20th anniversary, I, it, I started this when it was my 20th anniversary, I decided that I wanted to do something big to celebrate that. Um, and I quickly realized I don't just wanna celebrate my 20th um, my 20th year in my career, I want to celebrate the mindset of what it takes to have this kind of career in the face of all the opposition. Um, and so I moved from doing a concert, which I was going to do, to, to actually putting on the biggest event of my entire life, which I just did a month ago, uh, called the Lightning Machine. And it was a um, three-day inspiration expo. And I called it the Lightning Machine because it uh, there was a story from early in my career when I was chasing hip hop and I went to a record, I uh, went to a music conference and an executive said something that I never forgot. He said, 
you know, I'm standing there, I'm sitting in the room surrounded by all these hundreds of other artists all holding on to our demos, looking up at this stage, at this panel, hoping to be discovered. And this executive said, the number of people that go from completely nowhere in the music industry to completely successful in the music industry is a less than the number of people that get struck by lightning twice, twice. And I was like, twice, what the hell? And I'm suddenly looking back around the room and I feel like now I'm looking at all, all these hundreds of artists all looking up at the sky, hoping to be struck by lightning. And that was when my career trajectory changed and when I decided to stop chasing lightning and to start making lightning and to build up my life a lightning machine, to generate my own lightning. And that's why I called this event the lightning machine because I wanted to celebrate the mindset of lightning makers, people that are unafraid to go into the dark places and be the light. And I created a whole, you know, this three-day inspiration expo. We brought, we had panels in, all these lightning makers, all these innovators in music and in tech and in innovation and education, panels, pop-ups, performances. <clears throat> and then it all culminated in um, kind of a next level spoken word concert of my material over, over uh, 20 years that we did at the El Rey Theater in downtown. But it was a celebration of that mindset that you have to have. And I'll give you a uh, a taste of that poem. I was not prepared to perform, so I might stumble through it. But just a taste of that performance, of that poem that, that speaks to the, the mental health part that you were just talking about, that says, um, uh, what is it? I jump in. As a matter of fact, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull it up so I don't get it wrong. And I know you guys can just edit it out. But I mean, I mean Hold on, hold on, hold on. We're pausing. Jeopardy music is playing. Jeopardy music is playing. Hold on. It's almost there. And here. It says, um, <clears throat> uh, it's what we, uh, it's what we do. Somebody rock the bells. We don't chase lightning round here. We make lightning ourselves. We are gladiators in lightning rounds. So we train for the pounding. Every day is leg day, baby. Because we stay climbing mountains. Because this lightning life we bout, it ain't an uphill battle. No, it's an uphill both ways in the snow battle. It's a set goal, stink bold, fine flow battle. It's a no compass, no map, no road battle. And it's not like darkness never wins a round. It's not like there aren't rounds when trauma trips my breaker, when overwhelm overloads my panel and I short circuit because it just feels easier to let the world be flat. Feels easier to let someone else draw all the maps, but that's when I hear the clap of someone else's thunder. Someone else reminding me that I'm a damn world wonder, that mountains are merely foremans standing before my Ali exactly 44 seconds before I sting like a bee. My greatness does not cease to exist just because it's dark. I'm a machine designed to convert pain into art. So if I fall under pressure it's to become origami they said my flavor can't exist till i made myself umami so that's just a taste of of the way that i sort of view that mental health component right yes there are times when we short circuit but we have to be the ones that remind ourselves that we're the ones trying to tell the world that it's not flat and so, it's so, that comes along with that you know yeah like on that topic First of all, that was yeah. For, congratulations on the 20 year anniversary last year and the the event you just put on. That sounds like it was you know very important to you and you. Um, different than a lot of what you've done. But you mentioned in order to have like to f have this mental fortitude, everything that you mentioned, you either need to be hardwired or re rewire yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How can someone that maybe isn't necessarily hardwired initially, how can they rewire themselves to? Um, to employ this mindset that you have? Yeah. Yeah, great question. I think I think um, a lot of it is, you know, some of the stuff you heard me talk about at your company, a lot of um, a lot of changing your mindset. Mindset is 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 one of the main things that you need to begin to work on. So when I talk to you about going off and doing improv, it was not like I said, not to become a performer, which some which is why people dismiss it. Like I'm not trying to become an improv performer. <clears throat> but improv says you never get to negate something that's thrown at you. You always have to accept it and transform it. And so that's mindset training. 
right? The same way that the performer is saying, somebody, give me a scene, give me a word, and no matter what I'm doing, I'm in, in a scene and somebody else enters the scene or somebody else gives a suggestion from the audience, I can't reject it. Well, that's what we're used to because we're used to being in control of things. And so we're used to being able to say, nope, that doesn't work for me, here's the parameters. Nope, that doesn't work for me, here's what we're doing. Improv says you don't get to say no. So what if you could never say no? What if you could never reject something that's thrown at you? That, that rewires your mindset to say, okay, so I welcome anything that's thrown at me. So if you think about uh, the concept of, of disruption, pre-2020, uh, pre um, up until 2019, my, two of my biggest presentations, my most popular presentations were the presentation on innovation and the presentation on disruption. That's what everybody was focused on. This new tech, AI, uh, robotics, exponential technology, something, digitization, virtualization. It's going to be this technology that disrupts us, disrupts us. We have to prepare for innovation and disruption. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden 2020 came, on, came along. Funny. I didn't get booked to talk about disruption anymore, <laughs> right? Because the whole world got disrupted, but they didn't get disrupted by the thing that they thought was going to disrupt them. And that's the thing that you have to, so the companies that survive are the ones that go, it doesn't matter what disrupts us. We are prepared, we welcome, we expect, we anticipate that there will be an interruption, there will be a disruption, there will be something that shakes the ground under us. And we're prepared for that. We've created that culture, that mindset to be able to constantly transform uh, that potential disaster to delight. Yes, uh, uh, new technology and watch what I do with it. Yes, global pandemic and watch how I get down. You're always able to yes, yes and yourself. So that's one of the ways as, as an example of rewiring the way that you simply think about possibility. One of the other ones is, is learning to harness the power of inspiration. And you heard me talk about this. We are all in the inspiration business as leaders especially as communicators, especially. Um, and the more that you begin to realize this, the more that you have a responsibility to harness the ability to be inspiring and to stop thinking about inspiration as this thing that's outside of you. <clears throat> because the more that you can inspire people around you, the more that you galvanize them around that vision, right? So I had to be able to not just tell people poetic voice is different and here's what it can do. I had to recognize that I can't just inspire the audiences i'll never get to the audiences to inspire them if i can't inspire the people that are responsible for booking or the people that are responsible for putting someone on in on this particular stage in front of this audience um and so i had to recognize that my ability as a business leader was still still needed to harness the ability to be inspiring to stop thinking of inspiration as this thing that's reserved for the gandhis and the oprahs of the world and to recognize that i in whatever capacity whatever role i have can be inspiring and one of the things that you need to be inspiring is to be inspired and so if you think about the going back to that mental health component um you know people are always asking you what inspires you and i'm like i I don't have the luxury of, of waiting for inspiration like I used to. I used to be like, oh, I'm mad at my mom. I'll write a mad at my mom poem. I'm in love. I'll write a I'm in love poem. And now it's like, yo, I got to get out this blood transfusion for Mayo Clinic. <laughs> I got to get out this blood transfusion poem in, you know, by Friday, right? So I can't just sit around and wait for inspiration. I got to go mining for inspiration. I got to harness and dig up and unearth the things that inspire me on command. And, when, and by doing that, I stay in a state of constantly being inspired. I keep my antenna up and I'm receiving that inspiration and that bolsters me, that harnesses, I mean, that uh, 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 fortifies me to be able to constantly go out and see new possibilities. And that's one of the things that you have to harness as you're trying to rewire yourself is you have to be the person that is constantly seeing new possibilities. You're the one that says, you know, I, I say innovators see the world through the machete shaped lens of a trailblazer who is used to standing in the wilderness, but being the only one that sees the inevitable path. You have to be the person that says there is a possibility here that you all don't see, and I'm going to be the one to show you. And so the more that you're training yourself to see new possibilities, the more empowered you are. And you, inspiration is one of the tools that can train your mindset to do that because inspiration creates a peephole to possibility so that you see possibilities that others don't. So those are just two examples of how it is that you can start to change your mindset to hardwire yourself as someone that can not only do this, but withstand the turbulence that, that's going to come from doing it. Sekou, really good stuff. I mean, I just think about, I, I continue to think about the corporate setting that you seemingly inspire, right? I was going to get into inspiration because that's ultimately what your spoken poetry seems to do for a business. 
And I just think about myself, you know, as a man growing up where, um, you know, I grew up an athlete and, you know, through our school system and into corporate, you know, creativity, um, color isn't necessarily encouraged in the arenas I've uh, been in, if you could imagine. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about, you know, process and running playbook and yeah. um, not thinking outside the box so much. And I just wonder how much that really suppresses people's creative muscle and how much you almost kind of bring that out of them in a way that they can almost live vicariously through you because there's maybe an insecurity around being creative or explicitly creative and out there. You know, I think yeah. that that's not something that's necessarily encouraged with certain, you know, demographics or certain people, in, you know, in, in certain regards and certain environments such as corporate. So, you know, it's just remarkable to think that, um, of a room of people that can so easily rally around that inspiration that you're able to provide. Do you have anything to say about that? Or have you put some thought into that with the, the arenas that you've stepped foot into it's essentially their territory. Uh, again, I'll describe it as grayscale, but then you come in and bring the color. Um, yeah. Just curious, like, have you shared similar experiences growing up and like, is that part of your inspiration for yourself? Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, business beats it out of us. Um, you're absolutely right. Business beats it out of us. They beat that creative spirit out of us. Um, the corporate world, even sometimes the educational world, you know, if you sit back and think about arts and schools, right? Um, and how you, there's such a big movement and such a fight for people to create, to, to, to uh, uh, keep arts as a part of our education. We, it's like we told ourselves, oh, well, all you have to learn is math and English and so forth. <clears throat> and it's like, yes, there's a functional aspect of that. But what art teaches us is that creative problem solving that you need to use math and English to solve a greater function for yourself, for your family, for your job, for society at large. Um, and that's why, you know, steam, that's why STEM became STEAM, right? Uh, in science and technology and engineering math also added art into it. I remember when I, when I, um, I went to the Claremont College, I went to uh, Pitzer College, but, but if you were uh, at one of the Claremont Colleges, you could take classes at any of the colleges and Harvey Mudd is the, the top engineering um, school in the, in the country and um, is one of the Claremont Colleges and I took a um, music class, music, uh, you know, like music writing, chart writing class um, from someone at Harvey Mudd College, and he was an engineer talking about the parallel between the musical chord structure and engineering and math. And it was just mind blowing to just look at those those parallels. Right. And and it's why, like, there's a, there's a poem I have called The Music Movement that then talks about, you know, it's not just music for our ears, it's music, it's music to our bodies, it's music to our brains, it's increased literacy and math skills attained, it's millions more graduation caps that will be gained when the sweet sound of success is a high school band playing with music programs raising test scores by 20%. Cutting music funding to save money for English and math is like removing a car's engine to save money on gas. It was only when Albert Einstein, tortured by futile calculations and feeling all was lost, took a moment to put down his chalk and bathe his violin in Bach that his capacity for creativity revealed his theory of relativity. And that's what we forget in education and in business and in science is we forget that, yes, it's sometimes the, there's the functional component of the, the, the intellectual, the scholastic work and so forth. <clears throat> but when you think about things like creativity, when you think about things like communication and artistry and performance and, and, and inspiration, those often the glue that binds those things in a way that allows them, allows us to, to, to um, not just continue the world going round, but to move the world forward in new ways, right? And that's what those possibilities, those, those lightning makers have to be able to do. And that's part of that hardwiring. So I think that creativity training is critical. And that is why uh, folks bring me in. And that's why I talk about the, the power of creativity as it relates to innovation. I'll, I'll end uh, the, my answer to this question with a story that was just told to me. I just spoke to, what were they? Uh, uh, what industry? I feel like it was a it was a healthcare, it was either a healthcare client or it was a tech client. I can't remember. Did a poetic voice keynote for them. Did my keynote on innovation, which is back now. 
<laughs> now that now that now that the world has survived the global pandemic, folks are ready to talk about being innovative again. And so I did my keynote on uh, on DIY innovation, and the uh, the corporate communication VP was talking to me at the reception afterwards, and you know they were raving about the the presentation, and she said, you know what was probably the most profound. She said, everyone's been talking about you, the, everyone at every dinner table, at every lunch table, every bathroom conversation. <clears throat> but she said, the most profound one for me was I was on the elevator with one of our guys that I know him. He's very unassuming. This little guy that just doesn't talk a lot, doesn't, he's very unassuming, you know, doesn't, you don't, you have to dig out to get, you know, to get insight from him. And we're on the elevator and I'm asking him what, you know, was his favorite presentation? He said to you, and I said, well, why? And she was like, she was like, what were the takeaways? What were the top three takeaways that you took from it? And that's how a lot of times the business leaders and, 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 and educators and so forth, they think, they're like, what's the, the lesson? What's the takeaway? What's the thing that I can write down? And, um, let's do be, oh, okay, you guys cut off for a second. Um, and what she said that he said was, there were, th there were lots of notes that I took and great phrases and great things that I can take back to my team. But when I really, sat back afterwards it's like he pulled a veil away it's like he lifted up this veil of how i had been seeing the world and our company and myself and it's like he just made me think about myself and what i can do and what we can do and our company can do differently it's hard to explain but it was it's more like this lens was shifted and i now see everything differently and i think that was one of the hardest things to communicate to my clients because they're used to, well, what are his five takeaways going to be? That's how we ascribe his value. And I'm like, that's not the value that you really need when you're saying we are the company of the future and we're gonna take ourselves into the future. What you need is a culture that sees themselves differently, that sees everything that they do differently, sees their customers differently, sees the impact that they can make differently. And that's where I live. And I'm an industry outsider trying to tell you that that's what you need when you're telling me, no, that's not what we need. And that became one of the biggest challenges. But when it happens and they begin to, uh, that linear person unlocks that creative um, problem solving ability, it transforms them and it transforms the culture and the company in, in new ways. Very well said. Hey, Seiku, I just want to first of all, thank you. We're going to wrap up here with three rapid fire questions for you, but thank you for sharing yeah. your story, your wisdom. Uh, it's very much appreciated. The first question I've got for you is just your favorite quote or like your best, the best piece of advice you've ever been given. Oh man. Um, whew, you were talking about a quote guy. So favorite quote. Oh, you know what? One of them has always been, um, oh my God. And now I'm going to forget it. Of course. It's like when you ask somebody their favorite song, they can, they sing them all day. <laughs> and now they can't think of it. Um, Howard Thurman, um, what is it? Don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do that because that's you coming alive is what the world needs. That's a paraphrase of the quote. <laughs> I'm sure you can find the like actual it. quote online, but I love that quote because that really embodies that sense of like, find your purpose, right? Finds what makes you, what, what, what makes your lightning spark. Find what makes what electrifies you and then go be that for the world because that's ultimately what the world needs. Yeah. Don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it because what the world needs is more people who have come alive. Yes. There you go. Yeah, that's it. Uh, that's a great quote. The next one is, if you could have dinner with anyone in the world, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Matt and MB. Boom. No. <laughs> two on the nose. Two on the nose. Um, come on over. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if I could have dinner with anyone in the world, you said dead or alive? Yep. Who would it be? <laughs> so it's so funny because I've, I've been asked this question a lot um, over the years or a variation of this question. And my answer has changed over the years. Um, uh, lately, one of the people that has just been on my target list, I'm not a big celebrity person and you know, oh, I get wrapped up in celebrities and so forth. But there is one person that I've just always sort of been impressed and modeled my career after. And it's but somebody nobody would expect. Queen Latifah. Okay. Queen Latifah. Uh, I feel like one of the things I love about Queen Latifah is that she started as a hip hop artist. Obviously, I, I relate to that. 
Um, but she started as a conscious hip hop artist that went against the grain. She wasn't doing what everybody was making money at. She was a part of the conscious movement and she and her consciousness has stayed a part of everything she's done and she has conquered almost every media out there, television, film, music, voiceover, commercials and, and all of it. And she has maintained being herself. Right. And she said at one point she was like, I'm not going to do hip hop. I'm going to go do a jazz album and I'm just going to do a Dana Owens jazz album. And she did a jazz album and then she does movies and she and even if you watch the equalizer equalizer right now, her show on CBS, there's a high level of consciousness of her dealing with social impact issues on a CBS show. Right. I love that because I find myself so inspired by people that are able to stay themselves in a world that's constantly telling you, here's how you need to change for the money. And she's done that beautifully. And I would love to just sit at dinner, take her to dinner and, and pick her brain and share stories. That's beautiful. Queen Latifah, if you're listening to this, here you go. Queen Latifah, holla at your boy. <laughs> and lastly, just what do you like to do in your free time, like hobbies, that kind of thing? Uh, I, uh, I love making music. I still produce music. I don't do it enough. Uh, my two biggest hobbies have been music and martial arts. Um, I've, done music and, and produced music and song written and so forth for years. I, as life got busier and, uh, you know, I started running a company and blah, blah, blah. Um, I've had less time for it. Same thing with martial arts. I, I, I practice uh, <coughs> Kung Fu, a style of Kung Fu called Sansu, <coughs> excuse me. And, um, and I have dropped in and out of training for years. And now I have a three-year-old. Um, and you know, if you know anything about my journey and my story, it took a long time for my wife and I to actually have our kids. So, uh, probably the number one thing is just spending time with my baby girl. Uh, but outside of that, I really have been trying to get back into my music and my martial arts to keep myself balanced and keep myself a whole person that's not just in the grind. That's part of the problem when what you do is what you love, is that it can be consuming. And I started, people are like, what are your hobbies and what do you do? And I'm like, well, my work is my hobby. My, I made a career out of the thing I love doing, you know? But you have to keep yourself balanced as part of your mental health because you can turn the thing that you do into the thing that you hate. You can quit your job to go do the thing that you love and turn the thing that you love into the job that you hate if you're not careful. And you have to pay attention to the things that keep fueling you and the things that keep inspiring you and keep electrifying you. And those are three things. So I try to keep those things close to me and keep myself in harmony with them. Very cool. Yeah, I think we had someone that actually, one of our guests that said like, I don't have hobbies, I do what I love. And so I, I just think about what you said right there. Um, but anyway, th thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to sign off here. Take care, guys. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.